Hey all, hope all is well. This is another video in the Road to Grandmaster series, and this one I'm going to go over my round four game from the World Open. Now, if you followed the round three video, you know that I won a fairly up and down game against I am elect Robbie Adamson, and it was just nice to win, but I didn't play that well, particularly in the opening, and I was hoping to play a little bit cleaner in this one. Now, I am on two and a half out of three, and having won two games um, now, I was actually playing up finally, and my opponent was an extremely strong grandmaster by the name of Vasif Durabali. Um, Vasif is actually over 2,600 feet A and has been so for quite some time, and was actually a student at Webster University, but I believe he has since graduated um, and is pursuing chess professionally, as, at least for now, um, but is a very, very strong player and a tough opponent to play against, particularly with the black pieces. So anyways, uh, let's get into it. So Vasif opened with d4. Um, this was actually a little bit of a surprise because he's mainly an e4 player, um, and he actually told me after the game that he'd actually been trying to expand his repertoire. So go figure. Um, I was one of the first people he expanded his repertoire against. A after d4, I went d5, c4, e6, knight f3, and a6. And this a6 line has been something that I've used from time to time. Um, the threat with a6 is that you're actually attacking the c4 pawn right away um, because now you can reinforce it with b5. So you're actually kind of provoking a crisis in the middle of the board indirectly with the move a6. Typically, white players play c takes d5 in this position, and you typically get some type of exchange, queen's gambit exchange variation with a6 included. And white has a slight lead in development because I I haven't developed any of my minor pieces yet, uh, yet, but black has a relatively solid structure, and this a6 move is actually useful because it you know defends the b5 square and is a nice prophylactic move against impending minority attacks on, the, on b4, b5. So it's actually not as suspect as it looks. In any case, Vasif, uh, after a6, did not go for c takes d5 and went bishop g5. And this is actually a move that is not as popular, nearly as popular as c takes d5 or e3. It's probably like the third or fourth choice in this position. But it's actually a choice that has some real venom. The idea is that either way that black tries to deal with the threat against the queen, he's kind of a little bit uncomfortable. So if you play f6, first of all, that's not totally a desirable move because you weaken the, the e8, h5 diagonal and the g8, a2 diagonal and in turn the king, the king side. So you don't necessarily want to do that. And I, actually, Magnus Carlsen actually tried f6 in a real tournament game against y his countryman Jan Ludwig Hammer and actually lost after bishop d2. And it was actually a terrible game by Magnus, but... There haven't been many takers of f since f6 since. The other way you could uh, respond is just to play knight f6, um, but you don't actually relieve the pin. This pin is kind of annoying, and you still keep that. This this pin is is just going to stay there for a while, and essentially this doesn't necessarily make use of the a6 move totally well because um, now uh, after e3. White pretty much has a maybe a tempo up on queen's gambit decline positions. Uh, and then the other move you could play, and the one I actually played, is bishop e7. And the idea there is that you just trade these bishops on g5 and e7, and um, you argue that um, your queen's going to come to e7 uh, and be a little bit better developed, a little bit closer to connecting your rooks than you were a move ago, um, and you just get a stable position. Now, the downside of playing bishop e7 is that after an ex subsequent exchange, what did wind up happening the dark squares in black's camp are just a little bit sensitive, and technically this bishop on c8 is a quote-unquote bad bishop for now because it's locked behind this chain. And so they're kind of you know pluses and, and drawbacks to every move, but basically the drawbacks here is that this bishop seemingly is a bad bishop for now, and these dark squares are maybe a touch sensitive because the bishop on f8 is removed. So anyways, after uh, queen takes e7, white played knight bd2. 
This is actually the normal way of defending the C4 pawn in this position, in part because taking on C4 is extremely undesirable. If you take on C4, the knight comes to C4, and white has a really nice clamp on the E5 square, and um, you don't really want to play B5 because you actually weaken too many squares on the C file, um, and it just is very suspect. So taking on C4 is actually not necessarily something that uh, black wants to do and because of this black has a little bit of a tricky time playing very actively now the drawback of the knight on d2 if there is one is that from d2 it's actually not it actually exerting pressure on the center like it would be if it was on c3 and so with the pawn on d5 right now the knight is actually technically dominated although again it's doing a great job of reinforcing the c4 pawn, so it's not necessarily a, a bad knight. It's just those are the dynamics. After knight bd2, I went knight f6, just developing, recognizing that taking on c4 was ill-advised. And now uh, white went for e3, which is, again, a kind of normal move in this position, just continuing to develop. And now I castled, and now bishop d3 was played. And ultimately, the question here you have to ask as the black player, and the one I was wondering, is which pawn break am I going to go for, c5 or e5, or am I going to play it you know, solid and not try to break? And that's actually the kind of quintessential, quintessential question here, because again, if I take on c4, the knight comes to c4, and there's this annoying bind on e5, obviously I can't really play e5 right now because white is clamping down on it. But now if I play c5, that also has some implications because um, maybe white goes rook c1 and is able to pressure the c file very quickly, even though I might exchange. So for instance, let's say I play c5 now. After d takes c5, if I played queen takes... You know, this move rook c1 could be very annoying, basically coming with tempo. And actually, maybe it's even better to start with c takes d5, and then if knight takes d5, rook c1. And yeah, just a little bit unpleasant for, for black, because this knight is slightly misplaced on d5, I'd much rather be on f6. My queen is harassed, and I'm going to have a hard time developing my bishop on c8 and the rest of my queen side pieces. And so I think white has a slight advantage here with me lashing out with c5. Um, now, the flip side is that I can try to prepare it c5, but, you know, whatever I do, it's kind of going to be a little bit tricky to get off one of those breaks. The other way to play it is to try to play for e5, and I could do that by maybe playing knight bd7 and then e5, but again, there's some tricks there as well, because when I push e5, I'm really weakening the d5 pawn, and again, it's not super desirable to have the c file open up very quickly when the c7 pawn might be a target. So anyways, I actually wound up playing knight bd7, um, and now white castle, and again I had this question, do I, do, should I play for e5 or c5? And I thought for some time, but I just thought e5 was a little bit too risky, it weakened too many squares the, uh, on, the, on this diagonal, it weakened the light squares, it weakened d5 and f5 specifically, and uh, so I actually decided to play c5 instead. And I was hoping that with c5, now that my knight was on d7, I could recapture on c5 with the knight if he took. And then I thought I would equalize pretty easily because the bishop on d3 is a target, and now I'm almost ready to connect my rooks. But instead, after c5, Vasev played a move I simply did not consider, and I think it's actually a pretty interesting try. And it's the move knight e5. And the more I actually looked at this move, the more I kind of grew wary of it because I recognized that, you know, even though I managed to get in my c5 break, it wasn't so e easy to equalize here. So the first issue that I thought was actually if I play um, knight takes e5. After knight takes e5, d takes e5, knight d7, and f4, it seemed like white had a really nice bind on the king side. And this pawn on e5 in particular gives white really uh, excellent attacking chances on the king side, or so I thought. Um, another line that I was looking at after knight e5 was just maybe trying to play b6. And the point was to kind of keep the tension and try to develop my bishop and not give the, him this nice pawn wedge on e5. But the reason I rejected this is because I thought I was 
I thought he might be able to get something here. I thought maybe you could put another knight on f3 or maybe knight c6. It turns out these were not actually serious uh, moves, and b6 actually would have been a very, very decent uh, try. The point is now if knight takes d7, bishop takes d7, I just connect my rooks, and white can exchange a few times, but my hanging pawns here are actually quite well defended, and uh, I can just go rook h f d8, and then bishop e8, and c5 is protected, d5 is protected, and even though I may potentially have an extra pawn island after c d5, e d5. Um, I might have three pawn islands and black may, uh, might, might only have two. Um, this position is actually totally fine for black. So b6 definitely was something I could have played. The other move I was considering was actually the move b5. And this was a super, super aggressive, radical idea. The point was that if white takes on b5 like this, now I can play c4 and then recapture on b5 with a really nice pawn chain. And this is a move I seriously considered. But again, I, I was a little bit wary of doing it because I was always afraid of knight c6. It turns out that knight c6 is just a one-move idea. And after queen d6, this knight is really, you know, almost trapped so 96 was not something i should have worried about and i was frankly just seeing ghosts so unfortunately i i probably did not respond in the act most active way and this actually got me into a little bit of trouble instead i did play knight takes e5 um now the one other line i, I do want to point out before i go for the game was if i play c takes d4 i thought oh maybe having the isolated pawn would be promising um to play against but actually turns out that after e takes d4 d takes c4 and then knight takes c4 these knights are actually extremely annoying and he actually has decent attacking chances connected with rook c1 and even sometimes knight e5 or queen f3 it's just very annoying to develop the rest of my queen side pieces again note that if i play a move like b5 knight a5 might be a possibility and you could just see the c6 squares you know crying out to be occupied and uh, it just seems a little bit unpleasant to my eye so yeah so that was the thing that was actually most discouraging is the positional approach that i actually was thinking about with you know playing against the isolated pawn it seemed like you'd be getting a quite annoying an initiative although maybe it's not that much and i probably was perhaps respecting his ideas a little bit too much because after knight takes e5, d takes e5, knight d7, and f4, which actually happened, here his initiative is much, much clearer. Uh, my knight is now a little bit misplaced. It doesn't have a great square to go to anymore. This bishop is training right at h7, and the queen can get involved very quickly as well. And this position is actually already a bit unpleasant to play. Now, I wound up playing g6 just to kind of blunt this bishop on the diagonal. I thought that was super important. But g6 is actually a somewhat double-edged move because even though I'm shutting down the bishop, I'm weakening all these dark squares around my king. Well, d6 was already weak, but I just want to point that out as well. This pawn on e5 is in just a massive wedge right here. And so if a knight was ever able to park itself on one of these dark squares, I'd be in serious, serious trouble. And so it's a very double-edged decision I made. After g6, white went e4. And I think this is another point about why maybe playing knight takes e5 and then this knight d7 maneuver was not so wise. Because, the, frankly, white can very easily undouble his pawns in positions like this with e4. And then the knight all of a sudden would actually get this wonderful outpost. So the issue is actually I can't take on e4 and kind of try to open up the position because... My, my dark squares are just too weak. So instead, I pretty much thought I was forced to play d4 and lock things up. But now it's going to be very, very difficult to get counterplay with the center closed and white pretty much having a free hand on the, queen, on the king side. Instead, I actually could have played d takes c4, believe it or not. And the point is actually that after knight takes c4, b5, and then knight d6, it actually turns out that I can start to undermine this knight right away with the kind of counterintuitive f6. I did not see, like really take this seriously because I just saw a knight on d6 and I was like, oh, no, can't allow that outpost, move on to something else. 
But I really do need to le- look deeper sometimes when I'm analyzing, and I'd reject lines without calculation, and that's a problem. After f6, uh, I'm already threading the e5 pawn twice. And again, if the e5 pawn drops, then the knight on d6 drops. So this is actually a viable way to play. Now, white is not worse or anything. In fact, white's probably a tiny bit better after a4, now trying to undermine my queen side. But now I can play f takes e5, and white is obliged to play bishop e2 now to cover that d6 knight. Note that trading on c8 um, with knight takes c8, rook a takes c8 is not, oops, sorry, rook a takes c8 is not really a problem for me. And now I have great uh, control of the dark squares here. And this bishop is actually kind of restricted behind its own pawn on e4. And note that if I move like a takes b5, I have the nice intermediate move c4. And then when the bishop moves, then I can recover this pawn on b5. And now black would be for choice here. So really, f6 was pretty important. After a4, fe5, bishop e2, b takes a4, I'm temporarily up two pawns. Um, but of course, these pa- my pawns, extra pawns are kind of ugly, and this knight is still on d6. So white's still playing with a little bit of initiative here. But now after knight f6, I'm actually threatening rook d8 and pinning this knight. And the point is the knight is not, no longer stable. So after f takes g6, h takes g6, black is actually in very, very reasonable shape. So again, I probably should have, you know, you know, s- taken more time here to examine some of these lines because really I very w- willingly gone to a passive position with limited counterplay. After e4, d4, white went queen g4, and already here I was like, oh brother, this is not looking good because it just seems like rook f3 is an idea, the queen swinging over, it just seems very dangerous. Now the one thing that is kind of a saving grace for me at the moment is my knight on d7 is actually doing a great job of guarding the e5 pawn or basically attacking it because it actually stops f5 in its tracks. If you play f5, I play knight takes e5 and with tempo and that's not something that white can really tolerate. So it's actually not totally easy for white to continue this attack. The other thing that's important to note is that this queen e7 is actually eyeing the h4 square. And so if you consider how, you know, if you consider white trying to go for this brute force caveman checkmate with rook f3 and rook h3, you actually need two squares on the h file that aren't covered to execute that mate. And there's no real effective way for the queen to get to one of these squares, um, h6 or h4, um, without my queen uh, interposing first. So it actually, this actually, this position seems more dangerous than it is, and I could have actually, you know, defended this with if I didn't like totally panic. I could have started with a move like uh, King H8, for instance, just a little bit of prophylaxis dealing with F5, and even the strange looking Rook G8 and Rook G7 would pretty much defend adequately for now because again, F5 is not really possible. And especially with the rook on g8, then I can actually just take with the g-pawn and open up the g-file. So as suspect as this is, it's not actually the end of the world. And because it's not the end of the world, I shouldn't have panicked the way I did. Now, I thought, oh my god, this queen on g4, the rook is coming to f3, I need to desperately get aggressive. And so I actually wound up playing b5 which is a pawn sacrifice potentially, opening up, trying to open up lines and distract white from this, his bishop and knight on this side of the board. Um, but again, b5 was not actually necessary. Instead, I could actually just go b6 and quite calmly go bishop b7, and then one day actually just prepare f6 or f5. Um, and uh, yeah, black's actually doing okay. Instead, after b5, Rook A, E1 was played, and yeah, I was actually quite surprised he didn't go for the pawn, but this is also reasonable. He's putting his rook on this square. It's pretty active. He might be preparing F5 down the line, and if E takes F5, the rook opens up. But again, F5 is not really feasible until the E5 pawn is protected. After Rook A, E1, I went King H8, kind of trying to respond prophylactically to this F5 idea. Um... But I also probably could have just defended the b-pawn. I mean, maybe even a move like rook b8 is playable because, again, he cannot yet play f5, or at least I don't think he can. Uh, 
Well, actually, maybe with rook b8 he can, because if I go, if he goes f5 now and I take, queen g3 might be a little bit annoying, because my rook on b8 and my knight on e5 are both under, under siege. But even here, I'm not buying it. I mean, I have f6, and my knight is pretty much cemented here, and this bishop actually doesn't get into the game until the e4 pawn moves. So basically, there was no need to sack the b5 pawn the way I did. The other issue is that after King H8, which I played, and he took, uh, he he actually he actually sometimes can get the C4 square for his knight, and that's the other thing I have to kind of be wary of is if this position opens up and the knight comes to D6, I'm in some trouble. After King H8, White went Queen G3, and now was quite clear that he is actually preparing the F5 move, and I have to be a little bit alert. I decide to play rook g8, but this isn't actually the best move. Instead, knight b6 was actually stronger. The point is that I'm actually targeting the c4 pawn, and now if you try to play c takes d5, a takes b5, and bishop takes b5, my knight's actually guarding c4, so the knight can't just jump there unscathed, and I can take on a2, and the material is actually equal. And the point to the thing to remember to point out is that, again, if f5, um, a few things. Firstly, I don't necessarily have to take it. Um, but actually here, it's actually totally fine because I could just play bishop takes f5 and no harm, no foul. There's no, there are no tactics here that expose my king on h8. So yeah, f5 is actually kind of being held up because my bishop is lined up on this diagonal. And yeah, there's just actually no real attack just yet. So yeah, knight b6 would have been much better. Instead, I went rook g8, and it's just a little bit too passive. And um, yeah, it just misses the mark, because now white gets to play c takes b5. And after a takes b5, bishop takes b5, he's essentially, you know, won a pawn, but he's also got this c4 square for his knight. And if again, if that knight lands on a dark square, I'm going to be in serious trouble. I went rook takes a2 just trying to recover material. I thought that I pretty much had to take this pawn on a2 because if I don't, I thought, you know, if I go like knight b6 now, I thought white just goes a4 and consolidates, and then the a pawn might become a factor. Um, so I thought I would need to uh, to deal with that. So I took. But now the move knight c4 came. This move is extremely strong and, frankly, is kind of what I missed, is that, you know, this knight comes to d6, and it's nearly decisive, because, you know, in conjunction with f5, the f7 pawn is just going to drop, and it also uh, beautifully holds up my own pawns on the queen side, so just a tough, tough spot with knight c4. Now, it turns out here I have one way to actually kind of fight on here and make the position unclear, but unfortunately I did not catch this over the board, or at least I saw this, but I actually didn't go for it. I I rejected it because I thought it would be losing in the long run, but the move actually that holds the position together for me is actually bishop a6, and the point is, is that if you trade these bishops, um, there's not as much pressure on the position, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, it's it, it's just not it's just not as bad a position for black. So, for instance, if bishop takes a six, rook takes a six, and knight d six now. Well, f a few things. First of all, black could consider playing rook takes d six um, and executing an exchange sacrifice. Um, the point is that these pawns can be a factor. And uh, the rook now can get kind of active and gang up on the b2 pawn. And as long as there isn't any decisive breakthrough, black will have counterplay here. The other thing is that after knight, at knight d6 is white, uh, black may consider actually playing a move like f5 now. And the point is, is that now I, you know, get rid of my, basically my weakened, um, my weak, my weak backward f pawn because you can't take here with en passant because d6 hangs. So actually, the position becomes tenable because now this pawn isn't backward. I don't have to worry about f5 breaks anymore. And now my rook on g8 can do something else. And again, if you play e takes f5, I can go g takes f5 and get counterplay on the g file. 
So this is another potential idea connected to bishop a6. But the biggest question with bishop a6 is what do you do if queen b3 is played? Because now this rook is being harassed and doesn't have a square to go to. And so I'm going to have to sacrifice the exchange. And these were the lines, uh, these were the lines I was looking at and, and saying, ah, I don't know, it probably doesn't work. But actually after bishop takes b5, queen takes a2, and g5, the position is actually incredibly unclear because I undermine, uh, one, by undermining the f4 pawn, then the e5 pawn drops. And note that I will wind up playing bishop takes c4, knight takes e5. And if I have this monster knight on e5 with two connected passers, the position is just not clear at all. White would probably go f5, uh, pushing forward and not allowing my rook to activate on the g-file. But now I can play bishop takes c4, queen takes e4, knight takes e5, and I have a pawn for the exchange. I have a, you know, a really nicely blockading knight on e5, and I have a d-pawn that may provide some counterplay. And the computer's actually evaluating this as slightly better for white, but no more than that. So definitely an opportunity I should have... Um, should have taken because I saw the line, but I basically decided not to go for it. And this is actually something I've been sort of struggling with lately is just calculating properly and then not going for it for some frivolous reason. Um, but yeah, you gotta you gotta go for the lines you calculate. I mean, that's that's pretty much what you should do. Um, so I see so often what winds up happening is, uh, in a lot of people's games is you essentially you calculate a move for a long time, you calculate a variation for a long time, then there's something you don't like about it, and then you play another move without any calculation. And that's kind of what I did here. And it's kind of like if you've calculated the specific line, you might as well go for it. Because it's kind of the best chance you have, right? It's the thing you've looked at the deepest. So anyways, after uh, knight c4, I actually went rook a8, and rook a8 is simply a losing move because it's just too passive. It doesn't challenge these two minor pieces that are extremely active, and my minor pieces are passive, and if they remain passive, I'm going to lose the game. And so it actually just allows white way too much uh, play here because now the pieces stay on the board and invade with devastating decisive effect. And on general terms, if you just think about it, the side that has more space wants to keep pieces on the board, and because I lack space, I ought to be trying to trade them. So the fact that I, I did not play bishop a6 and try to trade things was very foolish. So anyways, after rook a, the position is totally lost because this move rook a1. And this is actually the, the big issue, is that now white, instead of, you know, basically trying to press on the h file or something just now takes advantage of the new newly open a file and invades there and i can't hold together the queen side and also the king side and um yeah it's kind of just a principle of multiple weaknesses so i went rook b8 now avoiding a, a trade of rooks on a8 but note that if i did play rook uh, rook takes a1, excuse me, rook takes a1, rook a7 is a massive threat, and this pin is just decisive, and I can't really do anything about it. So uh, I win rook b8 to at least be able to meet rook a7 with rook b7, but um, now bishop takes d7 was played, which is extremely effective. Getting rid of um, my knight on, on d7 that was guarding a, a dark square, because now after queen takes d7 which i played note i didn't want to go bishop takes d7 because rook a7 again just invades on with decisive effect on the dark squares but i, I went queen takes d7 and this also is problematic now because of queen g5 and you could just see that the dark squares uh these weaknesses that i I, I created by playing g6 earlier in the game are now coming home to roost and uh it's just very very difficult to cover them now, I played queen d8, just trying to guard the f6 square because I really didn't want to play rook g7 um, after a queen f6 check. But now, white actually played a winning tactical move. Actually, not even that hard to see. The move knight d6, and the position is just completely lost. The issue now is that if I take on g5, 
knight takes f7 check uh, comes with tempo, and after king g7, knight takes g5. Not only is white up a pawn, rook a7 is also coming. The e6 pawn is also a problem. There are just a lot of problems in the position. And in fact, maybe it's not even the best move to play knight takes f7. It could just be better to play f takes g5 and then just play rook takes f7 and then double up the rooks and play rook h7 mate. In any case, my king is totally locked out here. My bishop is a really bad bishop, and this is a really good knight, and the position is completely lost. So I didn't see any reason to play on here and threw in the towel extremely early. Um, this is only move 23, but I had seen enough. Tough game to play. Um, I, I was very disappointed that I did not you know, show better against... A strong a strong player I mean you know this was my opportunity playing up to like you know kind of make something of of the tournament and uh, this one just completely missed the mark and it kind of reminded me of Chic of the Chicago Open where I lost a few games and 20 something moves to Grandmasters it's just totally it's honestly a psychological thing because you shouldn't lose to anyone in 20 moves no matter how good they are so very very disappointing I will say I was actually experiencing severe stomach pain again. Um, it's not something that I'm sort of happy to talk about all the time, but um, it was actually physically really affecting me at the board, and it was really, really tough to concentrate. And um, it actually became a, a major, major theme in this tournament. So um, I'll get into it a little bit more in the next one. But yeah, it is what it is. Anyways, um, thanks for watching. Please like and or subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support the Road to Grandmaster journey, you could do so by making a donation through the PayPal link in the description below. Thanks again. Take care.